Frank, welcome to the show. I've been fortunate enough to meet you in person. Feels like a long time ago when we first met back at PodFest, which was end of January in Orlando. And we were on a panel together. So it was, it was an honor sitting next to you and talking about mental health. And then we've chatted since then briefly, but I'm really excited to have you on today and have the opportunity to share your story with the listeners. I wish I could say the same, but please tell them I'm a comedian by trade before we go. <laughs> That's probably a good starting point. Tell us more about the whole aspect of being a comedian. Uh, what's brought you here now and where were you before and what allowed you to want to become a, and, and I know that you've got some cool stories. You, you also used to right for uh, Jay Leno. So uh, I'm putting that plug in there for you. Thank you. Yes, it all started in fourth grade, Ms. Dark's class. I was nine years old. I told my first joke. The kids laughed. Mrs. Dark was so hysterical she had to excuse herself to go to the teacher's lounge. And years later, I bumped into her at the grocery store and I said, Mrs. Dark, why did you go to the teacher's lounge? She said, Frank, because I was laughing so hard. I thought that you'd misinterpret my laughter and break your heart. And then she said, what are you doing for a living now? I said, stand-up comedy. She goes, oh, that, that figures. Yeah. So that's how I got started. In 12th grade, there was a talent show. And nobody had ever done stand-up. So I did 15 minutes of stand-up. I'm sure if I heard the tape now, I would be horrified. But the, all the high school kids loved it. And I won. Of course, I beat the accordion player and the folk dancers. Not a real tough victory, but I won. And then I got hired by an insurance company in my hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina. And they conveniently moved me to San Diego, California, where there is a branch of the world famous comedy store, the one up on Sunset in LA. Mm -hmm. And at my first open mic night on April 1st, 1984, halfway through my five minute set, I heard this inside my head You're home. Decided at that moment I was going to do it full time. Had no idea how. I've threatened to write a keynote called What Could You Do If You Didn't Know Twitter? Because I had no idea. A year and a half later, I said to my girlfriend, now my wife of 37 years, I'm going on the road to be a stand up comic professionally. Do you want to come along for the ride? Figuring she'd go, Oh, hell no. She goes, Yeah. So we gave up the apartment, our job, jumped into my tiny Dodge Colt, and we're on the road doing comedy clubs. She just came along for the ride for 2,629 nights in a row nonstop, seven years of change. And during that time, Leno was a permanent guest host on The Tonight Show. And Johnny Carson would pull up on a Friday night and tell his staff, out of nowhere, I'm taking next week off which meant Leno would be working four nights the following week, 18 jokes per monologue per night. So he started hiring comics, road comics, under contract to write jokes. So over the weekend, I'd pump in 12 or 24 jokes a day, and a couple of them would make it into the monologues that week. And then when he got the job full time, he let most of the contract comics go, but he kept some of us on until he left for CNBC a number of years later. That's how I got And a really nice guy, by the way. When I had my first open heart surgery, my first aortic valve replacement, when I got to my regular room out of ICU, the first person to call was Leno. Hey, heard you had your uh, heart surgery done. Good thing you didn't have it in LA. They'd take it out and leave it out. Just a genuinely, and when I wrote my, co-wrote, we co-wrote co four books on men's mental health. In book number four, we wanted a little marketing push. So my co-author said, would you ask Leno to, to blurb the book, to write a blurb for the cover? So I called him up and he said, sure. So he wrote a blurb for the book, for our fourth book for the cover to help us with the marketing. Really, genuinely nice guy. Well, the, the road tour came to an end in 93, 1993, when I got a job back in my old hometown of Raleigh, North Carolina, as a co-host on a morning show, the number one morning show in Raleigh. And 18 months later, I drove it to number six. Which a friend of mine said, you can drive it into the ground. You drove it in the middle earth, which I did and got fired. I don't know if you know this, but there are two kinds of people in radio. People who have been fired, people are going to be fired. So, and then by that time, the comedy club 
road more called for closing than opening. So it was disappearing. My act had been clean. So I thought I'll do corporate comedy. And people ask, what's the difference between a club comic and a corporate comic? About $5,000 a night plus travel. I'm no math major, but that made sense. Some yeah. of my purest comedy friends, purest comedian friends were outraged. You went corporate, you sold out. I said, yes, I'm a prostitute, but I'm a high paid prostitute. I rode that horse until the end of 2007. And then the world economy collapsed and mm -hmm. speaking, including corporate comedy dropped off 80% overnight. And I ran my credit lines out as far as I could. And in April of 2010, after filing chapter seven bankruptcy and losing everything, that's when I learned what the barrel on my gun tasted like, literally. Spoiler alert, I did not pull the trigger. Uh, a friend of mine came up after a keynote recently. He'd never heard me say that. He goes, hey, man, how come you didn't pull the trigger? I go, hey, man, can you try to sound slightly less disappointed? <laughs> yeah. So when speaking came back, meeting planners, speakers bureau said to me, Frank, we love you. Can't pay that kind of dough anymore just to be funny. You got to teach the audience something. I'd always wanted to make a living and a difference, just could never figure out how. What do I have to teach anybody? I read a great book by Judy Carter called The Message of You, Turning Your Life into a Money-Making Speaking Career. She's a friend. She gave me the book. She said, Frank, read the book. You'll figure it out. I went into it thinking I got nothing. And about halfway through, because she walks you through the process, almost fill in the blank. I thought, I do have something. Given the fact I came close to suicide and I have two mental illnesses and there are more nuts in my family than in a squirrel turd, I thought if I got some training, certifications, I could keynote on suicide prevention. And so I became the mental health comedian. Now, second hurdle, everybody thinks of me as a comic. Who's going to take me serious? So my wife said, do a TEDx. So I applied for a TEDx and I got it. And it was on suicide prevention. And that proved to meeting planners, figures, bureaus, I could do something serious with humor, not jokes, but funny personal anecdotes. And Two TEDx events saw that TEDx and called me and said, do you have any more mental health topics? So that's how I got number two and number three. I just did number 12, which is a world record, December 30 of last year. And I've got number 13 booked in November. So that's how I got here. No, no thank you for sharing that story. Quite the journey you've had over the years and one thing in terms of your comedy style, you're able to make light of some of the things that perhaps can be devastating for a lot of people. And, and oh, I'm yeah. sure yourself included, but you're able to find some humor in it. I, I'm just curious for the listeners too, what's your inspiration behind your joke, especially when you were writing for the monologues, what was your inspiration for the joke? And the other thing I do want to understand is because I've watched a lot of stand-up comedy, there's always this storytelling aspect that somehow grips people. So just from your perspective, what is it that for you lends that story? For Leno, it was all topical. So it was, everybody was working with the same source material. I would read two or three newspapers a day, the USA Today, the New York Times, and whatever local paper, wherever we happened to be. And we, everybody wrote jokes based on that. The, the trick was to write the best joke based on that story. And then I would record Leno's monologue each night and play it back. And I would make note of what premises he chose. And then I would try to write a better joke based on the premise he chose. And my favorite was, he came on one night, yeah, the Swiss, they opened a condom factory in Switzerland. Do you really want to buy a condom from a country that makes cheese with holes in it? So I thought there's got to be a better joke. So I came up with they Swiss, they opened up a condom factory. The Swiss is not just a condom, it's a condom, it's a corkscrew, it's a pair of pliers, it's scissors. And it got more laughs than the first one. For my personal, for my comedy, for my acts, I did some topical comedy, but for my act, it was Seinfeld-esque and that it was just or stories about ordinary things like renting a car or flying on a plane or being 
later in life, being middle-aged, losing my hair, being on a high fiber diet is very much slice of life. Yeah. Relatables. Eddie Murphy said his first comedy special raw, I think was amazing. His second one struggled a bit. And he said later in an interview on late night television, the problem was his first one was about his growing up and how difficult that was being poor and eating ketchup sandwiches and mom hitting him with a shoe. He said the second one, nobody really wants to hear what happened in the limousine that day. So it was much more difficult. The yeah. comedy's in the struggle. Tragedy plus time equals comedy. Yeah. That's where the, that's where the comedy is, the frustration, the struggle, the, the effort you have to make. Yeah. It's and I think it's the relatability too, right? That's how you grip people is you take them on a journey and there's aspects of it that I can relate to. So I want to hear that punchline. I'm, I'm coming for the ride. So yeah. that, and, and a lot of the times there's that aspect, but you also touched on the mental health side of it and definitely come back to that. But I'm always fascinated, right? With comedians, you're out, you're on stage, you're putting yourself out there. You might get heckled. People might not laugh at your joke. And in that moment, you have to pivot and try to find different angles. But how do you balance that? Especially you mentioned, you've touched on your own mental health. How do you reconcile that knowing that you're exposing yourself further and there could be times where you might be leaving the stage and thinking what the hell just happened out there? Oh, many times. 45 minutes of silence, even though I pivot, pivot. After several pivots, you just realize it's not going to happen. And you put it on autopilot and go through it because you have to do the 45 minutes or you don't get a check. I can remember a comic friend of mine. I was listening to his show. He's going on before me and nothing crickets. And finally he said, you guys are looking at me like a geek. I'm looking at you guys like a car payment. So you have to think about the money because that's now there have been nights where I've been on stage and it's been awful. And I'm thinking to myself, I, w I would rather have taken the money out of savings than do this gig, but that's the comedy you get paid for. I tell, I've taught comedy off and on through the years, Stand up comp. I go, look, you don't get paid for the good shows. The ones where you breathe heavy, they laugh. You get paid for the ones where it's like talking to fish in a pond. Those are the ones here for, because, yeah. and it makes you a better comic. It, now that said, somebody asked me, have you ever quit stand up comedy a thousand times after a horrible show? Yeah. But the trick is the next morning I decided well, I'll continue doing stand up comedy. So quit a thousand times, started back up a thousand and one. Yeah. That's what you're sharing. There is this whole aspect of resilience, right? Bouncing back, keep coming back. And that's something you also shared in your story. Well, right. You touched on the recession or the crisis we all kind of experienced globally. Yes. And you touched on perhaps even looking at suicides side of things. And I know you yep. talked about it when we were there in Orlando too. So I do want to expand on that. What's allowed you stick with it and be resilient despite some of the challenges you've experienced in your life and the adversity and some of the dark thoughts that people can go through, what's allowed you to stick with it and how are you using your own experience then to inspire others through some of the work you're doing, whether it's speaking or talking to people directly. My wife has been a great inspiration. She's believed in me even when I didn't believe in myself. I, I would say something like, I'm going to get a real job. And she goes, no, you're not. You're going to follow your gift. Because I do believe it's my gift. I do believe I was born to do stand-up comedy or born to entertain, born to speak. I didn't speak until I was two years old and what came out one of my first words was a full sentence. I think I almost, my mother almost had a stroke. I said, may I please have a glass of water, mommy, were my first words. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't say anything up to that point. But I didn't. My mother is actually my reason for, my number one reason for not killing myself. Because she had difficulty getting pregnant. 
and she got pregnant, carried it to term, and it passed away shortly after birth. And a year later, she got pregnant again and carried it for nine months, and shortly after birth, it passed away. Somewhere she found the courage to try a third time when I was born, a fourth time my sister was born. I don't know where anybody finds that kind of courage. So my feeling is she was so brave and worked so hard to bring me here that I have to be at least as brave and work at least as hard to stay until my appointed time. That's what, that's where my resilience comes from her. She's the most resilient person I've ever met. I just also speaking on suicide prevention, I have two mental illnesses. One's called major depressive disorder, kind of garden variety depression. And then I have something far more rare, which is chronic suicidal ideation or chronic suicidality. And that's so rare that I've said that out loud to therapists. People have been doing it 20 years and they stare at me like a pig staring at a wristwatch. They have no idea what I'm talking about. It's not in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical yeah. Manual of, of Disease. Hopefully it'll be in six. But I tell a story every time I keynote, I say, this is what I have. And for people in my tribe who have that, it means the option of suicide is always on the menu as a solution for problems large and small. And when I say small, I tell the audience, look, my car broke down a couple of years ago. I had three thoughts unbidden. One, get it fixed. Two, buy new. And three, I could just kill myself. The benefit of telling that story is every time I've spoken since 2014, there's been at least one person in the audience who has chronic suicidal ideation and they have no idea it has a name. They think they're just some kind of freak and completely alone. And last month, a young woman came up after my presentation crying and she couldn't speak. She was crying so hard. And I said, you have chronic suicidal ideation. She nodded. I said, you didn't know it had a name. You just thought you were some kind of freak. She nodded. I said, do you have a therapist? Nod. When you get home, make an appointment, tell the therapist everything you learned today. And for God's sakes, tell them you Googled it. Don't tell them you learned it from a comedian. And I got an email a week later and said, Frank, I think I was at that conference in large part simply to meet you. You've changed my life. And I cannot say that about a lot of people. That is my motivation yeah. to continue. I feel like George Bailey in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, that I've been showing what people's lives might be like if I weren't there. To just reassure them in situations like that. And if I kill myself, theoretically, I could take a lot of those people with me. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. So there's a few th things I do want to unpack there. First of all, help us understand what goes on when you're dealing with that suicidal ideation. Because what I've come to understand is it feels like a lonely place, right? You often feel like no one's really going to understand. I'm dealing with this all alone. There's another aspect where I've heard anecdotes where people feel like it's not really going to matter. I'm gone, whether I'm here or whether I'm gone, it doesn't really matter. No one's really going to care, which is something you've already alluded to that you do see the impact you're having on the lives of other people. And you mm -hmm. recognize that you're serving a purpose here. And often that purpose, not obvious for people. And that's where a lot of the times depression can take a stranglehold on people. So that's another thing you've said you, you, you deal with. So mm -hmm. how are you able to balance that? And when you do have those moments where, I don't know how you would describe it, but where you're feeling that pressure, what's going on in your head? The suicidality generally rears its ugly head when I'm under stress. So your brain's way is coping mechanism. It's your brain's way of saying, hey, I can fix this. You're not going to like the solution, but I can fix it. So it's, uh, I've mean, had so many of those that it, mm -hmm. it's not a serious thought. Now, one of the other symptoms of chronic suicidal ideation, and you hear people say this, I'm driving down the highway, up ahead's a bridge abutment, and I'm not under stress particularly. It's just another day. And I look at the bridge above me as I'm coming up and thinking, if I turn my wheel just a little bit, that would be that. Or yeah. a train's coming. If I could get under the guard, the crossing guards, then that would be that. It's just, it's just the way, the strange way my brain works. Not serious thoughts. I'm not going to pull onto the tracks. Yeah. It's, but just the way my brain works. The depression, I have a cycle. Most people have a cycle of depression. Mine's three days. First day I wind. First day I'm going down, second day I flatten out, third day I'm coming back up. 
And I used to say, I fight depression, but that's not true because fight implies I can win and I cannot. I can lose and kill myself or die and stay alive, but uneasy truth like North and South Korea. So what I decided to do is rather than fight it, I take what I call an Aikido approach. Aikido is a martial art where you blend with your opponent's energy. As, they're, as, the, as the punch or whatever's coming by, you step offline, you blend with their energy. So I just think of it as riding a wave. When I feel myself going down, I get on my, my surfboard and I ride the wave knowing that in 72 hours it will break and I'll be, I'll be flying level again. Rather than fight, fighting depression takes a lot of energy and it's wasted. I'm not, I'm never going to beat it. It's in my DNA. It runs in my family. My grandmother died by suicide. My great aunt died by suicide. My mother did it slowly. So it's just, yeah, it's silly to waste that kind of energy. And I, what I try to do is use that energy to move forward right. rather than fight up against. It. Yeah. But suicidality, it's, it's, if it weren't for my suicidality, I probably would have killed myself a long time ago. It's odd, but because it's not, because I've already decided I could kill myself. There are three legs on a stool of suicidality. One is you've decided you could do it. Two is you generally socially isolate, so you can do it. And three is something called burdensomeness. And you touched on it in that people feel like they're a burden, that the world would be better off without them. Like I said, that nobody would miss them, that they're not really making a difference and why bother? So burdensomeness is one of the three legs of the stool. And I was going to kill myself because we were under a great financial burden. We'd lost everything. And I had a million dollar life insurance policy. So I thought I can fix this. So people think that you're not considering when you're considering suicide, you're not considering the people who you leave behind. In a lot of cases, the person who's suicidal is thinking about the people they're going to leave behind and feel like they will be better off with me gone. I knew my wife would be better off financially, not emotionally, but financially a million dollars. Unfortunately, having sold insurance straight out of college, I knew that most policies have a two year suicide clause. If you kill yourself in less than two years, they don't pay anything. If you kill yourself two years in a day, they pay a million bucks. So I called my insurance agent and guess what? I'd only had the policy for 22 months. I had to wait 60 days to kill myself. And I was like, hell, I could do that. So fortunately, I wasn't marking days off the calendar. I don't remember day 61 or 62 or waking up thinking, I could do it today. I think things got a little better. Bankruptcy went through. Phone calls stopped. So fortunately, if it hadn't been for that, if it had been in force, fully in force, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah. Pretty deep and you feel like circumstances changing prevented your decision? Is that really true? I think that just enough for me to break the surface, take a deep breath. I'm just speculating because I, I yeah. don't recall 61 or two or three. I don't, yeah. even, I don't even recall when I thought, hey, I could do it again. I have that thought, wait, how many days? Oh, wow, it's been two and a half months. I could do that. So it's, and coming back from that, we... My wife and I started from scratch. Well, that's, that's something that's difficult, I believe. A lot of people never make it back from mm -hmm. bankruptcy. It's, they just, you know, the cycle continues. Fortunately, we had some good advice on finances, rebuilding our credit and so forth. And we, we did have a place to go. We were able to homestead a little house she grew up in. So we had a place to go very fortunate, more fortunate than a lot of people at that point mm -hmm. in time. Yeah. And either blow up a relationship or drive you closer together. And fortunately, we got closer together. And one of the things we did to cope was play the grateful game. Every morning, we had to say three things we were grateful for. And it couldn't be the same three from the day before. So what you're doing is you're focusing on what you have. Right. Rather than what you lost. And the, if there's a great thing about bankruptcy, it gives you a really solid list of the things you need. Versus the things you want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that gratitude piece is so crucial, and I'm glad you touched on it because often when people fall into that trap, they lose sight of those small things that are happening, and, and we, we just lose focus of it, right? Yeah. The other piece you touched on with the depression was that resistance. And you talked about it in terms of energy and how we're sometimes wasting that energy resisting mm -hmm. the thing that we know is going to happen. In your case, you've learned, accept it and live with it. Where it's, I think for a lot of people, that's where they struggle to, right? Where situations in life are happening. It doesn't always have to be depression be difficult situations and we tend to resist, resist, whereas we could be taking that energy and flowing with it and finding, okay, where's the opportunity in this and what can I do with this? And in your case, you've just accepted that with depression that I know this is a cycle. I'm just going to ride this wave. And what are some of the other things that you're focusing on outside of the acceptance, knowing that, okay, three days, D2 is probably going to be the worst. But how do I ride this through? What are some things you're doing to make it easy on yourself rather than making it worse? And, and I suppose the resistance is one of those things that doesn't really help. Yes. I have a self-care plan. I think everybody neurotypical or neurodiverse should have a self-care plan. It's diet, exercise, a good night's sleep, which people discount. Medication. During the pandemic, a number of my friends contacted me because they were concerned because I live with mental illness and they, and they thought maybe it would take a greater toll on me because of my mental illness. And, but I had a self-care plan and I got together with a couple of my mentally ill friends wearing masks, of course, to have coffee. And we all agreed that we were well equipped to survive the pandemic because we've been practicing self-care for who knows how long. And so. They would call up and go, Frankie, I know you're mentally ill. Are you doing okay in the pandemic? And my stock response was this. Look, I've had two aortic valve replacements, a double bypass, a heart attack, three stents. I've totaled three cars. I have two mental illnesses, and I lost to a puppet on Star Search. This is not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And I actually did a keynote, a number of keynotes, called Social Distancing and Staying Sane, don't worry so much about your mentally ill friends. And the takeaway from the keynote was the call to action. You need a self-care plan because mm -hmm. this is the first pandemic. I doubt it's going to be the last. And so you need to, to have these things in place. And by the way, diet, exercise, good night's sleep, meditation, medication. The through line is those are all things I can control. And as somebody with mental illness, you pretty much have to let the rest go. Stuff you can't control. Absolutely. And just focus on the things you can control. And all five of those are within my power. And I believe, thanks to one of my clients, one of my coaching clients, that one of those five should be non-negotiable. That you always do it, regardless of whatever else you do that day. You always do it. And mine is working out. I, I, I do bodybuilding, believe it or not. I'm doing my fifth bodybuilding contest in July. In the, I'm in the 60 and over master's class. And, and that's part of my self-care. I believe you should have a, a hobby or an avocation that's completely opposite from your vocation. And I speak for a living, but you, I can bodybuild, work out, never speak to anybody. Even when I'm performing, just, you don't never have to open your mouth. So it's very much different. And you can see the gains and there's a consistency to lifting weights, no matter where you are in the world, a 25 pound dumbbell is a 25 pound dumbbell. So anywhere you walk into a gym, the labels on the machines and stuff may be different. It may be kilograms and not pounds, but it's very, it's a constant and in a world that's anything but constant. So yeah. I believe self-care plan is, and also, and I've done a TEDx on this, I believe firmly that my mental illness Depression and thoughts of suicide are simply the flip side of my creativity, imagination, and comic ability. The same brain, same wiring. I've told my comedy students, look, I can teach you to write stand-up. 
I can teach you to perform stand-up. I cannot teach you to process the incoming information the way my brain does. There is a reason that if somebody heckles me that I can respond literally without thinking. People ask me after I've responded, and it was very funny, how'd you think that up? Honestly, I didn't think it. It came out of my mouth. When you heard it, I heard it for the first time. But there's a reason that I can process like that. And I, so I, I take comfort in the fact that just they're two sides of the same coin. Without the mental illness, I don't know that I would have the mental, the, those mental powers to write comedy, perform comedy, handle hecklers, um, like that. Yeah, when I appreciate you touching on that whole self-care clan and, and you, know, you drew a parallel to bodybuilding as well in terms of the consistency. And that's the one thing I think really helps people is you do have a self-care plan. It needs to be consistent, right? Often we tend to look at these things. In your case, you've touched on the diet, the getting a good night's sleep, uh -huh. the meditation, the medication. Those are all things that you've built into your self-care plan. For some people, it may vary, but it's ensuring that you're doing it on a regular basis and you're remaining consistent and not waiting for the crisis to come to then pull on those things. So... That's just something I wanted to highlight. I, I, and the reason why I say that is because I've built in a similar practice for me that I do every morning, non-negotiable, and that allows me to remain focused, uh, show up in the best way possible. And also it allows me to keep my mental health challenges at bay because I know in the past when I wasn't doing that self-care, I was falling victim to some of the things that do come up and we all go through those, right? So ensuring that consistency is there. I do appreciate you touching on the bodybuilding because I did want to come to that, but that just it shows another element and adds another layer to you as an individual. How are you able to just keep yourself motivated in that sense? And what made you want to go down that path of wanting to compete and doing these competitions in the bodybuilding world? I always wanted to do that since I was in my teens, I, in the back of the comic book, there used to be a Charles Atlas. The bully comes and kicks the sand in the face of the guy at the beach. And he goes and he gets the Charles Atlas program. He lifts weights and then he takes on the bully. However, I knew that I'm fine boned. I'm sure it's the result of being a Southerner and inbreeding. And I knew I could never compete in my 20s, 30s, 40s, I thought, you know what? If I wait till I'm over 60, I'll bet you just about everybody has given up. And you know what? Pretty much everybody has given up. We did a contest last, last July, and there were four of us over 60. And this is an international bodybuilding federation, all natural, true natural. They polygraph you before they urine test you afterwards to make sure you're not juicing. And so... Our class of four guys over, it was the largest class that had ever competed at one of those events. There, and there were just four of them. And I've always, I don't know if you can see, that's my, that's me last July at 66 years old. I, I just wanted to do it and terrifies me. A friend of mine has a book called Seven Guiding Truths to Live Your Best Life. And one of the truths is do the thing that frightens you the most. I've opened up, I did two shows one summer at an amphitheater in Michigan for Randy, opened up for Randy Travis, the country singer, 5,000 people per night, 10,000 eyeballs. Now, Randy's got a band, backup singers, lyrics, music. I've got a microphone and 5,000 people, never even broke a sweat, standing on stage in bodybuilding trunks, essentially panties. And you have to do a minute, one minute routine where you flex and move and to music, flex and move, flex and that terrifying because I can't say anything. All I have to do is stand there and flex, move, flex, move. Although I do try to make it entertaining. Most of the guys are very young, very serious, rock anthem, just never smile. Last year, I did my minute to Kung Fu fighting that song. Everybody was fighting. And what I did was I did a Taekwondo kata because you go in, you go in for it. 
points of the compass. And so when I came back around to finish, a friend of mine said, here's how you finish this because you're doing punches, kicks, and flexing. He goes, you do the crane from the karate kid. Where when I got done with the double biceps, I went like this, my arms up like this, as Ralph Macchio does in that movie, and I did the kick for the crane, and the place went crazy. Well, laughing, clapping, because it was, it was entertaining. Unlike mm -hmm. most of the other very serious stoic. And an eight year old kid came up to me. You're so funny. I said, do you know how long it's been since an eight year old told me I was funny? Thank you, dude. Yeah. Yes. What I'm hearing there again is you've introduced a different element to it. I'm curious. And you touched on it, right? You have experience being on the stage, being in front of people. Only difference being with bodybuilding, you don't have the microphone. Is that the main reason that you're not able to get into your element and tell jokes that makes it so frightening? Well, to me, that, everything else is the same. I've had dreams. I don't know if you have, men have dreams oftentimes where it's a stress dream where you're out in public. For some reason, you're in your underwear. No, no apparent reason for being in your underwear. You're just in the hotel, in the lobby, in your underwear. So it's a nightmare. So being on stage wearing essentially tiny underwear, it's nightmarish. It's, and you're fully exposed. Talk about being vulnerable. Yep. You're, yeah. And they're, they're very kind. Nobody, unfortunately, the group I pose, train, train with for posing is up. They're young, but they're very kind. They don't make fun of me. What's a 67 year old guy doing this for, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of support, but still standing on stage, nearly naked and having to flex, potentially dance for a minute to muse. <laughs> it's so far out of anything else I've ever done. It not, wasn't really in my skill set until I started doing it. Right. So it's, but yeah, it's, and my goal eventually is to go pro. If I win my, if I win my category 60 and over, and then I can win 40 and over, it's called the overall. Yeah. And a 68 year old guy last year won the over 40. And they give you a pro card at that point. You get sponsors and so forth. That's my goal yeah. to eventually get to where I win the over 40 and get my pro card. So I, it's a goal. It gives me something yeah. to work. With. I go to the gym and I see people lifting all the time and there's much bigger guys there than I. But I'm thinking, you know what? It takes a whole different sort of testicular fortitude to take that and get on stage in front of people. They're working out to get bigger, better, whatever their reason is. I'm there. I've got a goal. I know July 23rd is coming up and I'm working hard every day for that one event. It's great to have a goal when you're working out and doing and committing that kind of time. And do you find like when you, you've got that goal and, and you're obviously working out to achieve that goal, is it helping with the depression or is that something that you basically, again, what's there? And if you go through that cycle, you, you power through, I'm thinking for what it is, but using your self care routine to power through and still be able to stick to your goal. Yes. It's, it, it doesn't really help with the depression. The help is with the self care plan. And I also do something called gamification, which means that you have to have a, a win somehow. For example, to get out of bed in the morning, if I'm having difficulty getting out of bed, I make a literal to do list of six things I want to get done that day, pen and paper. And the game is when I cross number six off my list, then I can go back to bed. I don't care what time of day it is, broad daylight, three in the afternoon. I can go back to bed, pull the covers over my head and binge watch the next episode of Ben, uh, of Franklin on Apple plus. So that's the win. And the right. gym is 25 minutes away. So the game is if I get to the gym and I'm dressed out and I'm ready to go, if I want to, I can go in. Do one rep of one exercise, turn around and go home. But that gets you, this gameification gets you moving forward because there's a win. 
Yeah. Now I've never gone back to bed at three in the afternoon. I've never gone in and done one rep and left, but right. takes the pressure off knowing that if I just do that minimum, then I've won and I can do whatever it is I really want to do that day. Yeah. And also, sometimes, sorry, right. go ahead. Also, I believe in having a schedule. They, uh, there was a guy in this, in the space station during the COVID pandemic, uh, isolated up there for a year alone and except when they brought groceries and they ask him how he handles that. And he goes, I've got a schedule. I go to bed, same time, get up, same time, work out, same time, binge watch Netflix, same time. So I try to keep to a schedule in bed within a, like an hour window every night up within an hour window in the morning, eat the same time. I'm on the keto diet. So I eat the same stuff every day. I do intermittent fasting right now. I'm having one meal a day as I'm cutting for the bodybuilding contest. Next month, it'll be one meal every two days, all within my control. It's just that having a schedule, I think helps a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. I think it's that whole aspect of routine where what's happening on any given day, so you're not falling short there. And in terms of that gam gamification, as you touched on, that movement is so important when you're in that depressed cycle. And the little wins help, right? Because that's a good way to get things going. Start off somewhere, you get that small win. Now you're starting to build some momentum. Whereas often when we're falling into those cycles, we're regressing, which doesn't help the whole process. It just fuels it further. Yeah. And if I was facing an un unending list of things to do, that would be different. But there's six things on that list. And feel good with that little win every time I scratch one off. No, when I scratch number six, if I want to go back to bed and binge watch the third season of Reacher on whatever Netflix, then I can if I want to. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to come back to the whole aspect of suicidal ideation we touched on. and You shared some experience, whether you're driving, see something, the thought will cross your mind. And it, what I want listeners to understand is those thoughts do come up and often there's judgment attached to that. I think, and what I want to understand from you also is, okay, so you have the idea across your head, but as long as you're not building a plan, where do you draw that line? So I think one of the things as a mental health practitioner, we focus on with someone is perhaps even alluding to suicidal ideation. Our line of questioning is around, okay, do you have a plan? Have you developed a plan? That's where you start determining if things might be getting serious here. What are your thoughts around that? Even with the just idea, see something, you're like, okay, if I just did this, it would be all over and things might be easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No planning there, really. I have had in the past, in the recent past, something I got, I was stressed about something. And I created a plan. I knew date, time, and met. I knew, was it place, time, and method? Yeah, you, cause you know, the protocol, you ask somebody if they have, are you th having thoughts of suicide? Yes. Do you have a plan? Yes. If it's, if it's specific to time, place, and method yeah. that when they need to be evaluated immediately, but most of those train coming, bridge abutment, driving a mountain road, looking down over the drop off. There's no planning. It's not a plan. I also talk about when I keynote besides if specific time, place and method, and I've never seen anything in the literature about what to do in this case. Let's say they've got a plan, but it's not really specific. What then I developed a question which is, okay, great. Now, are you going to kill yourself? And if they say no, my response is, okay, tell me why not. Make them give voice to whatever's keeping them here because something is keeping them here, pets, friends, family, religion, something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be having the conversation. And then whatever they tell you, then you try to leverage that to keep them alive for another day. Right. That's the, and I've never seen any of the literature about what well, a plan, but it's nebulous. What, uh, what's the next step there? 
Yeah, but that is the protocol. That's what when I keynote, that's what I teach. Well, what do you say to somebody who's you either they tell you they're suicidal or you believe in your gut? And I, I say go with your gut. If you think they're circling the drain, yeah. then and I teach people that. What do you say? What don't you say? What do you do? What don't you do? Um, and it's because I want to empower them because I'm the last statistics I saw said eight out of 10 people who are suicidal are ambivalent. They can't make up their mind. And nine out of 10 roughly give hints in the last week leading up to an attempt, which means and I tell the audience, you can make a difference. You can save a life and you can do it by doing something as simple as we're doing right here, having a conversation if you know how, and I just taught you how. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate the work you're doing and obviously you shared for you, for yourself, it is a sense of purpose there. Oh yeah. Now, there's obviously a lot of stigma around it. And sometimes people do get uncomfortable around this topic itself. And mm -hmm. I'm sure when you're going around giving keynotes, you're probably seeing it for the people in the audience as well. They probably have that discomfort come up for them. And, but the fact that you're doing it allows them to at least feel that sense of connection that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. So where do you see us making improvement in that space? You're only yourself doing that work, but how can we as a society get better at this? And it's not to normalize this, but making sure that people don't feel judged or don't feel like they're alone and or we can have healthy conversations like this around whether it's suicidal ideation or people even developing plans, talking through this and supporting each other because it's not something that's new and it's not going away. I feel like there's more stressors now. People are mm. digitally connected and they're seeing a lot of things that are also causing more depression than things did in the past. But yeah, how do we get that dialogue going? Well, I think the dialogue is important. I'd like to make it as easy to talk about depression, thoughts of suicide, mental illness, as it is to talk about sport. And I think if we allowed people to give voice to thoughts of suicide without locking them up for three days, there are situations where to protect them and others that the, the California 50, 5150, the, the law that says you go in front of a judge, the judge decides if you're a danger to yourself or others, and they can lock you down involuntarily for 72 hours. But problem with that is I was in San Diego doing a comedy gig and I'm talking to my nine table mates there at dinner and they asked if I did anything else. And I talked about my suicide prevention speaking. I talked about my mental illnesses and I got to go to the bathroom and I heard somebody coming up behind me. And it was a guy who was 69 years old and I had talked about chronic suicidal ideation. And he said, Frank, I have chronic suicidal ideation and I've never told anybody that including my therapist. And I believe it's because he felt that if he mentioned that he was having thoughts of suicide, the therapist is duty bound to refer him to, to be taken in front of a judge and they decide whether he spends 72 hours in a lovely gated community without, a, without his belt and shoestring. Right. So I think if we could talk more openly about our thoughts of suicide, because I do a keynote, I do general Q and A and I tell the audience, look, when we get done, you don't want a question to ask or a story to tell, and you don't want to tell in front of everybody. I'll hang out another 30, 45 minutes. Sometimes there's two people, sometimes there's 10. And almost all the conversations start this way. I've never told anybody. This. Mm -hmm. I, I say, I get that a lot. These are things I've given them permission to give voice to, but they. I did a thing in Cincinnati on site at a construction site. Six guys lined up when I got done. Men, which is unusual. Men tend not to share these sort of feelings. Right. Last guy in line, a young black man, probably in mid twenties, crying so hard he can't speak. So I wait. And when he gets gathers himself, I said, What's up? He says, well, I haven't slept in two nights. I work on the fifth floor of this building and I'm I'm thinking about throwing myself off every day. So I said, Why is that? He said, because I've lost three people in my life, very close to me in the last year to violence, including my daughter who died in my arms. And I'm almost certain 
that nobody he works with has ever heard this story. And maybe some of his family's never heard the story. So I waved the HR guy over who hired me. And I said, look, you need to go get the EAP binder, employee assistance program, find the closest mental health facility and get this young man there right now because he's circling the drain. So a couple of months later, I called the HR guy back about something else, just terrified to ask what happened to that nice young black man. <clears throat> Finally, I got up my nerve. I said, what happened to him? He said, Frank, he was evaluated. He was medicated. He's back on the job. But I imagine, again, he had never told anybody, as far as I know, that story. Certainly not the people he worked with. Yeah. And again, I'm vulnerable on stage, which give people like that, especially men like that, the permission to give voice without worrying about repercussions. Right. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that men typically don't talk about this, but typically, if you look across globe, statistically, three out of four deaths by suicide are, are men. So yep. it is definitely an issue. So, uh, and thank you for the work you're doing. Now, one other aspect, uh, I'm curious to gather your thoughts on it as well. And you've already touched on it where so many people come to you saying, I've never talked to anyone about this. Do you feel there's that fear around if I were to say something to a family member or friend, now they're going to be keeping an eye on me. And maybe it's not that serious. Maybe the thoughts crossed my mind. I was going through something difficult, but I don't want to really share it because now I don't want to scare people in my life. That's this is the thing I'm going to go ahead with. Yes, it, it, it's difficult to share with neurotypical human beings because it is frightening, especially if they don't know what to say. Either they don't say anything because they don't know what to say, or they're afraid if they say something, it'll push them over the edge. You know, the, the old wives tale, you should never mention the word suicide in front of somebody who's depressed because it might give them the idea. Yeah. Like it never crossed my mind. Yeah. And yet, the reverse is true. If you bring it up, they're less likely to end their lives. So it's, it, but yeah, there's a, a fear certainly wrapped around the, I tell people there's a stigma in, involved with mental health issues. There's also a separate stigma with thoughts of suicide. And yeah, maybe they're going to try, maybe they're going to be constantly asking you how you are and keeping an eye on you. And, but I tell people, look, when you're ready, tell anyone you love and trust what you're dealing with. So they can be there for you. Things melt down. Hmm. You're like a pit crew. No NASCAR driver waits until he's in the pit to hire a pit crew. <laughs> they're there waiting for him to pull into the pit and as the wheels come off. Yeah. And, and I guess message for people also on the receiving end of it, that just be supportive. And I think to your point, sometimes we don't know what the right thing is to say, but it's being supportive and offering empathy and being a sounding board. Sometimes that's what, that's all the other person needs in that moment. Yep. But you risk, I mean, there are people who don't believe in mental illness. Yeah. You rip sand to somebody or you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, turn that frown upside down. My personal favorite is, have you tried fish oil? At which point I go from suicidal to homicide. Because I, I just can't tell you how many times I've heard that. It's. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Yeah. I'm, and the more we have more podcasts like this, more appearances that I make, more celebrities who come out and share their struggles, the, the better it gets. We have a long way to go. But yeah, ab absolutely. It's one step at a time for sure. And, uh, again, I admire all the work you're doing, including the resilience and strength you've shown some of the stories you've shared with us today and all the amazing things you've been able to accomplish in your life. So Frank, thank you for coming on here, having this conversation with me, sharing your story, giving some insight and wisdom to myself and the listeners, but if there are ways people can get in touch with you or would like to learn more about the work you're doing. What are some ways they can do that? I've got a website, mentalhealthcomedian.com. Pretty simple. Yes. Easy to remember. Mentalhealthcomedian.com. I'll put that in the show notes. Thank you again, Frank. It was a uh, 
pleasure again to talk to you and connect. And uh, I'm looking forward to more of, of these conversations in the future. I'd be delighted. Thanks for having me on.